Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, check out www.patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast. There's over 200 patrons who are currently supporting the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. If you listen to the Tough Girl podcast on a regular basis, please take action now and become one of them. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Caroline Van Hemert. Caroline wrote an incredible book called The Sun is a Compass. And during this podcast, she shares more about her 4,000 mile wilderness journey from the Pacific rainforest to the Alaskan Arctic, traveling by rowboat, skis, foot, raft and canoe. I'm Caroline Van Hemert, and uh, I am a biologist and a writer and an adventurer, and then more recently a mom as well. And I work primarily in Alaska studying birds uh, in a variety of places, including the Arctic. And the big journey that we took that I describe in the book was um, kind of a culmination of a lifelong interest in the outdoors and the wilds, and it was a great opportunity for me to be able to take things on in a very um, sort of large, on a very large scale. And uh, I took this journey with my husband, Pat, who is also an important character in the book. And I'm excited to talk more about all of that uh, shortly. Take us back to your childhood growing up, because you, I think you were a little bit of a bookworm, weren't you? Or, but you were forced outside by your, by your parents. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so when I say a lifelong obsession, maybe that's a bit of a stretch because as a kid, I was very much a bookworm. I was much more content sitting on a couch uh, reading about somebody else's adventures, wherever they may be, than actually uh, taking them myself. And uh, my parents, thankfully, didn't kind of take that for a no for an answer. And so they were always encouraging me to be outside. And they actually limited the amount of hours I could read in a day and said, no, you need some fresh air. So <laughs> take a hike, literally. And um, yeah, we, we spent a lot of time as a kid just being outdoors, camping, hiking, not necessarily super extreme adventures, but things that kind of allowed me to um, get my fresh air besides just spending lots of time with books. And my parents both have a background in doing adventures themselves. And so I think by example, they've uh, showed me kind of what's possible and uh, led me to the outdoors through um, that mechanism. Yeah, I mean, and you you went on to actually study for your PhD in wildlife biology, and you've got a real passion for birds and bird beaks. Where did that love (laughs) of birds come from, and how did that evolve? Yeah, I think, you know, and I was always interested in in animals and wildlife, but really it came about in college. I had this amazing course with a professor who studied hummingbirds, and he gave me just a bit of insight into how incredible these, these critters are. And he really encouraged me to apply for my first field biology job, uh, which I got lucky with and ended up spending the summer with a bunch of birds and a a few other people in a pretty remote location. And that was kind of the beginning of what turned into a career and also a a lifelong passion. So Mm. you mentioned Pat, who's who's your husband, and he is sort of like, you know, obviously a key part of the book. Um, How did you guys meet? Yeah, he, it's kind of a fun story. He was my, my younger sister's roommate, actually, in college. And so I had um, come through town. I'd run up my first marathon and was visiting my sister. And there was this very quiet, very intriguing person who was living with her. And uh, he didn't say much of anything to me, but I had heard from my sister and from other people that he spent a year as a 19-year-old fresh out of high school in the Alaskan woods. And he is originally from New York, which... To most people in New York, Alaska feels like an entirely different planet. So it was kind of a stretch for a, a high school kid to pack up and um, show up in Alaska and decide to, to build a cabin and spend the year there. And it wasn't just a, a cabin in the woods. It was t- turned out to be a very remote location, and he was there alone for the whole winter. And so naturally, I found that very interesting and wanted to know more. And so that kind of evolved into a long-distance correspondence and pretty soon a relationship. And when did you guys marry? Wait, were you, sorry, were you married before you started your big adventure? We were married before then, yeah. We married in um, 2008 at a cabin that we subsequently built together uh, on the coast in southeast Alaska. 
you know, where the mountains meet the sea. And we had just a small group of uh, family and friends come out and we were married on the beach. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but I mean, let's talk about this, the 4,000 mile human powered expedition from the Pacific rainforest to the Arctic coast, six months, you and your husband, you cross some of the most remote and rugged places left left on earth, basically. I just, where did this idea come from? Like, how did this, how did this grow? Like, yeah, what was the seed? Yeah, you know, I think the seed actually started probably almost a decade before, shortly after Pat and I had met. So we spent that following summer. So we, we had this kind of long distance relationship going on. And I think he felt like maybe I was stalking him a bit. I was really interested and would call him up and, you know, we'd have these phone conversations where I was doing most of the talking. But he came up to Alaska and he, we went out to the cabin he had built in um, in the woods. And that maybe sealed the deal for me in terms of just finding, okay, this person not only has these huge dreams, he actually figures out ways to to make them happen. And that next summer, we spent uh, a couple of months in the remote um, Yukon territory, and we had this harebrained idea to build a canoe from the materials of the forest and then float north to the Arctic. And um, we almost starved. We didn't have enough food. There was no birch bark. There were all sorts of things that went terribly wrong, but we managed to kind of pull it off in the end. And I think that was such a formative experience in terms of our relationship and our connection to the outdoors. And so that was really where that first seed of taking on something like that, but on an even bigger scale was planted. And then, you know, life happens and we went, I went back to school and Pat took on um, a, a new job, kind of designing and building homes. And yeah, so things things diverted and, and we got busy with other commitments. And then we came to a point where we just realized if we were going to ever do something on that scale, it had to be then or now. <laughs> and um, it was also a time in my life where I was going through kind of a major transition uh, in terms of my own work passions, because I had just finished this PhD, like you said, in wildlife biology, and I was studying birds and specifically bird beaks. And so it ended up being a lot more time in the laboratory and looking through the microscope than I had ever anticipated. And that made me feel really antsy to be outside and also made me question what I was doing um, as, a, as a scientist and if that was really what I wanted. And so that seemed like a, a good jumping off point to do something completely different while we had the opportunity. Yeah, because that was obviously a really challenging time for you um, during, you know, during your PhD, but also with your with your family as well, and, and your dad getting diagnosed with with Parkinson's disease. How, how were you coping with all of these different challenges? You know, the academic stress, you know, fa- family stress, and and also just life, just life getting in the way and stopping you from from doing these adventures and you know living the life that you actually wanted to live. I think the um challenges that kind of come from life are both things that can stop us, but sometimes they're also uh, excuses to take on something really different. And that was definitely the case for this trip. So you mentioned my dad had been diagnosed pretty recently with Parkinson's disease, and that was obviously a big change for our family. And my dad was a really physical person and still is, although he's a bit more limited in what he can do. And so by example, he you know, showed me how being physically engaged with the world was such an important thing. And um, he was still able to do quite a lot at that point, but not all of the things that he once did. He had climbed what was then Mount McKinley, now Denali, with my mom um, before I was born and done a lot of other, you know, pretty physically challenging things. And so I think, you know, he had taught me over the years that that was one way to um, connect and to find our inner strength, I guess. And so it was, yeah, it was sort of a, like I said, a potential stopping point, but it was also an opportunity to to try something different. And so that was when we decided that we would launch out into the wilderness and <laughs> definitely connect with our physical, physical sides by uh, hiking and rowing and skiing and pack rafting, all of those things. So I mean, how did it come about with, with Pat? I mean, talking about it and you know starting to think more about making this big dream a reality was he in this sort of a similar place to you and you know wanting to to take on a challenge like this absolutely yeah and if anything I would say he was you know I I'm I'm very much the logistics person and I plan things out and I um, try to make sure that we have all of the pieces that we need in place and he is a dreamer I mean he can make the 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 parts fall into place as well but you know, you really need a dream to make 
uh, initial um, progress on on something of this scale. And so he would dream and he would draw on maps and we would together start to come up with ideas for how we were actually going to do this. And then little by little, we started to connect the dots of the places that we wanted to see and how we wanted to travel through these remote areas. And yeah, that's kind of how it, how it formed. But of course, with lots of hiccups along the way, as anything of this scale seems to require. Do you know, I can just imagine, you know, getting these maps out of the, you know, the Alaskan wilds and wilderness and just thinking, well, where do we want to go? How are we going to get there? And just doing that planning and letting the dreams flow and letting the ideas flow. And a lot of people do this. They do have these big, big dreams, but actually turning that into a reality, it's, um, I mean, I think some people can find it easy, but I think personally, it can be a really big, big challenge. How did you turn it into, into, actually, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you here. So let's start with the first one is mm-hmm. telling your friends and family, first of all, how did they feel when they, when you told them, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sort of make this quite drastic change in our life. We're going to head off on this, on this big journey. Did they understand where you were coming from? Were they supportive? Were they a little bit like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, how did they react? Yeah, I would say it was a mix. You know, some people thought it was kind of a, a crazy thing to do in part because I was just finishing this PhD and it was a move away from a professional transition into something that had nothing to do with um, science or at least not on the surface. Uh, I've been really fortunate to have parents who really have supported me in just about anything I've done. So whether I wanted to you know, become an attorney or become a biologist or a writer, they've always um, encouraged me along the way. And for the most part, you know, not really judged whether this was the right thing or um, a good choice, but just tried to help me move forward on it. And so we were really lucky to have that support. I think part of telling people that we were going to take this on is it made it, it made it real for us. And it also sort of secured this commitment. So I always find if there's something that, you know, I really want to do, I start telling people, maybe not about the specifics, but letting them know so that then I somehow feel that much more accountable to making it happen. And so I think that was a big part of it is when we actually felt comfortable telling people we knew this is, this is really going to happen. Um, yeah. So that was kind of how it came about for us. And, but I think professionally that was almost harder for me because I was, you know, had finished this PhD and was working with lots of other scientists and to tell them that I was going to go walk across, you know, the Yukon and Alaska and and whatever else, that seemed really absurd um, in contrast to doing the research and being so engaged as, uh, you know, a scientist and kind of a a potentially up and coming scientist. And so that was almost a harder uh, conversation for me than with family or friends who maybe understood where I was coming from. Mm. And you said that you are the logistics person, you enjoy the planning, uh, how do you even start with a challenge this big? Yeah, you know, for me, it's lists, <laughs> which is very boring. <laughs> um, and just starting to to slowly tick things off. So we, we would kind of do these triage efforts where we would, you know, create a list and then decide which of those things like had to be addressed in a timely fashion and which of them could we kick down the, the road a little bit longer and, and deal with as we needed to. And for Pat, it's looking at maps. And um, so I think jointly, we we kind of took on different sides of it and then would reconvene and figure out what parts needed to happen. So, you know, Pat was taping maps up on the wall, and then we were sort of tracing lines across them. And in a lot of these places, like you said, there are no guidebooks. They're maps, but they are very outdated or not accurate to what's actually on the landscape. So there's a lot of guesswork involved in reaching out to other people who maybe had experience in that particular region. But there were a lot of things that we couldn't figure out in advance and really had to to do as we as we went. How did you cope with like the unknowns during planning? Was that something that that stressed you out or were you sort of quite relaxed about that aspect? No, it was very stressful, definitely. And even during the trip, it, it I wouldn't say that I ever completely embraced this, you know, sort of uncertainty that is inherent to these kinds of trips, but it started to to feel more natural to me. And I think that was a really big challenge is because I am a planner and I like to know what's coming in advance. The fact that there was, there were so many unknowns and the reality is that there was no way we would ever have everything figured out in advance. Um, and we at some point just had to go or otherwise it wasn't going to happen. We had kind of critical timing with leaving in the spring and trying to finish up before winter in the Arctic. So if we waited until we were ready, we'd probably still be trying to plan at this point. There's just so many different pieces. And 
Um, even our, the rowboats that we ended up taking, this is a bit of a, um, a non sequitur, but Pat had to build them because we couldn't find them available to purchase. And that was not our original intention. I mean, he's an amazing builder, but he didn't need that on top of everything else. And when we went to, to try to buy rowboats that we had committed to because of we wanted to be able to use our whole bodies with the sliding seat setup, that they just weren't available to purchase anywhere. And so he finished them, you know, just days before we began our trip and we shipped them down to Bellingham where we started. And the day before we left was the very first time these boats had touched water and we had certainly never rowed them before. So there were a lot of pieces like that where there was so much uncertainty kind of inherent to the experience. And initially that made me feel very nervous and very stressed out. And in the end, it turned out to be sort of a gift because I think it's translated into the rest of my life. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say I was relaxed and <laughs> just kind of, um, yeah, like sitting back and, and hoping it was all going to work out. I was, I was definitely anxious about it. Yeah. Can I just get some like hardcore stats from you now? So yeah. how old were you and Pat when you started on this adventure? So I was 32 and Pat was 30. Pat was 30. And how long did you have to plan and prepare from, you know, from deciding that this is what you're going to do to having your start date? I would say that we had committed to the idea about a year in advance, but then the, the really intense planning didn't start until probably six months or so before. And even that was being squeezed in, you know, after work hours and on weekends and whenever we could, because we were both really busy with our current commitments. I was trying to finish my dissertation. Pat was trying to finish building a house. And um, as you mentioned, just life is always busy. So, And how long did you give yourself to do this, this incredible 4,000 mile, mile journey? Was there, was there sort of obviously definitive start date, but was the end date flexible or did you have to come back for a certain, in, in a certain time period or for another event or anything? No, that wasn't, it was, it was really the, the weather and the seasons that were dictating our schedule. So we didn't have a, a commitment to be back, but the reality was that if we didn't make it in time, things would start to freeze up in the Arctic. And in fact, we did encounter a lot of snow um, toward the end of our trip in the mountains that, that changed a lot of how we were doing things. So we knew that weather was, was going to, in climate or um, seasons were going to be the deciding factors and starting as early as we did in the spring, um, that was pushing it uh, on that end as well, because spring tends to be really stormy on the water. And so we were having to kind of negotiate the, the constant um, winds and waves and uh, things that made it more difficult for us to, to row our boats. And, and how long were you out there for? Um, in total? Yeah. Yeah, in total, we were, it was about six months, just over. Wow. And, and, you know, this is, this is one question that I'm really trying to ask like all of my guests now, because I think it's just so important to just try and get some transparency. Would you just be able to share a little bit more about the money side of things? As in, how did you, you know, how much did you need to save? How much did you budget? Um, you know, how did you work out the financing of this trip? Cause you know, obviously it would cost quite a bit of money to, to travel 4,000 miles. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I think I've gotten that question a number of times and, and, the I don't have like a, a, a dollar figure kind of in front of me. We were keeping track of it, and then at some point it was just kind of did what we needed to. But it actually was more affordable than than being at home and having a mortgage in a house or paying rent because we were sleeping you know for free every night. And I think the bigger expenses were things like building the rowboats. But Pat did that himself, and so it's just a material cost. And then you know outfitting, of course, costs money. We had to buy pack rafts. We ended up being able to borrow a canoe. And then there's just certain gear that we needed along the way. But I think in general, it's not – the expense is one of those things that that is built up in our heads as being a reason not to go. And and often for a trip this long, it it's not that expensive relative to the amount of time. So I think it's those week-long trips where maybe you're flying to some very remote location and – spending the time there and then flying back, that that really adds up in a hurry. We use the postal service almost exclusively for our food drops. So it was basically costs of, of shipping things to the U.S. and to Canada. Um, and then, you know, purchasing food, but that was mostly food that we would have bought anyway. So we didn't spend a whole lot of money along the way. And I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. I don't have, like I said, the dollar amounts, but it, it was, a, in retrospect, a lot more affordable than maybe I had originally imagined. Yeah, I mean, I definitely find traveling a lot, 
you can do it cheaper than you think you can do it, especially if you are, you know, out in the wilderness and you're and you're sleeping in tents and you're quite conscientious of your budget. I think when things start adding up is when you start going into towns and you start having, you know, staying in, in hotels or going out for like breakfast, lunch and dinner instead of eating like supermarket food, it, the cost can sort of accumulate quite quickly. Absolutely. And we, we didn't have too many of those temptations along the way, although I will say that a we stayed in a couple of hotels up in the Arctic, um, and hotel is a term used very loosely because it's more like a Connex trailer, you know, in somebody's backyard or something like that. So very, very basic accommodations, and they were outrageously expensive because things in remote places tend to be really expensive. But I think those are probably some of the most expensive hotels I've ever paid for, but they were worth every every dime for a hot shower, even if it was in, you know, a trailer or whatever. It was, yeah, those were luxuries that we didn't come by too often. Yeah. But also it's nice to treat yourself every every once in a while because you have, you know, you've been on this incredible journey. So actually let's let's start let's start at the beginning. So Bellingham, which is very close to Vancouver Island. Is is Bellingham in America or is that actually on the other side of is that in the is that on the Canada side? No, it's it's in yeah, it's in America. It's just south of the border. Awesome. So yeah, I mean take us to the start line. I mean, I can't even imagine what that must have been like, you know, you had this dream, you've been thinking about it, you know, for over a year. And then the final six months, the planning, the preparation, the logistics, the Pat with Pat building, having to build the boat, planning the food, doing the food drops, you finishing off your PhD and you know, sorting out life, basically. And then suddenly, you're in Bellingham, you're, you're heading off. Like, what was that like? Yeah, it was completely overwhelming, <laughs> to be honest. I would love to say there was, you know, this real celebratory air, but it wasn't. It was, it was, we were exhausted and we were stressed out. And we um, were wondering if any of this was actually going to work because we had put so much into it. And then, you know, you show up in Bellingham Bay and there are the rowboats we've never rowed before. And we we're realizing, oh, we forgot this, I forgot that. Um, didn't sleep the night before we were leaving because we were packing and trying to get ready. So yeah, it was, it was completely overwhelming. I don't know how else to say it. And, but there was a certain amount of relief in just setting out in, in the boats because we had been looking forward to this for so long that once we left, we knew that at least we were going somewhere, even if it wasn't where we intended. And, um, that first day in the rowboats though, it was hailing and it was actually pretty windy and we ended up having to, um, stop in a really inopportune place to camp, uh, because it was too rough to continue. So there was a lot of that. And I remember that first night in the tent, just thinking like, what have we gotten ourselves into? But I I'm too tired to, <laughs> to deal with that right now. So I am just going to go to sleep <laughs> and figure it out in the morning. When did reality sort of set in for you? When it was, just, when was it suddenly like, oh my God, we're actually doing this we are living our dream we've made this these these thoughts into a reality was there a moment or did it just sort of creep up on you very gradually I think it took probably a good week of being on the water initially it was really frustrating because rowboats are are kind of challenging to operate you know you go backwards that they have these 10 foot long oars there's a number of things that you know we've spent a lot of time on the water but we had never been in rowboats before so it took a while to transition um from just being completely klutzy and, and um, unable to make the boats go where we want to go to feeling like it was starting to be smooth. And then I think it also took me that long just to transition a bit out of my own head and all of the the kind of busy, busy, busy uh, commitments and schedules and um, emails and all of those things that had really consumed my, my world prior to leaving. Um, and maybe it was when we started to see some of the the migratory birds really coming in in big numbers that that was an opportunity for me to to let my mind go somewhere else and actually feel i guess that celebration that that wasn't there at the beginning that we have actually started this thing who knows where we're going to end up but but we're doing it so yeah. and it's amazing actually how much stress that we all carry with each other you, you know even just i think once even once you get away from it and you do get back out to nature it can take like a couple of days a couple of weeks until you're not sort of think constantly thinking about what have i done have i answered my emails what what phone calls do i need to make what do i need to achieve and actually start relaxing and appreciating be, being back in nature and and obviously you know you you've you, you you have studied wildlife and studied birds and that's obviously you know a real passion of yours but you'd started to lose that passion uh, while doing your PhD and spending a lot of time in the lab studying you know, these beaks and trying to figure out the, the problem with these curved beaks but what was it like for you actually getting back to to nature and 
and seeing the birds again did did that sort of help to reignite your your passion oh absolutely i think you know that that so much of our kind of specialized training whether it's in science or some other field is that the problem is it takes us sometimes away from what the roots of what of what we love are and for me that was definitely true i was I was drawn to birds and to wildlife kind of as a naturalist and watching what they did and being amazed by um, their behaviors and how they are in the world. And uh, so much of the research I was doing, I, I was trying to answer questions that I care deeply about, but the actual day-to-day of, of making that happen was was taking me out of kind of out of nature and out of the experience of just observing uh, birds and wildlife. And so having the chance to be there and not have my scientist cap on and not feel like I needed to, to get something from the birds and the animals I was seeing, but just be able to enjoy them was, was really important um, personally and turned out to be really important professionally too. Was there a moment that you could share that when you were out on this trip, that something that happened in nature or with the wildlife or with the birds, which you just thought, which you hadn't seen before, or, or you were suddenly like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, is it too far to transport toward the end of the trip? No, not at all. Okay. Okay. So, so there was, there was definitely a moment that I think kind of encapsulated so much of of what we had experienced on the trip. And that was um, in the the Arctic and the Brooks Range Mountains, and so we, pr- leading up to that, we I, there, we encountered a lot of the snow that I had mentioned, and we were running low on food, and we had um, had a meeting with a predatory bear that was trying to eat us. Just a lot of things went terribly wrong, and then we were stuck in the tent waiting for the one and only airdrop um, from a bush plane to bring our food, and it didn't come for five days, and so we were quite literally uh, starving. And when we finally got our food resupply, we got a, a canoe that we would use to float down the No Attack River, which was our very final leg of the journey. Um, we got in the boat, we started paddling, and it was a, about a day later, we saw what we thought were um, branches floating in the river and then realized they were caribou antlers. And we crossed paths with the, the Western Arctic caribou herd, this kind of mighty uh, caribou herd that exists in, in, in the Arctic and um, were able to be enfolded in their migration for hours. And so it turned out that there were thousands and thousands of caribou that passed us, sometimes coming so close that they were actually stepping over our legs or sniffing us just inches from our faces. We were right in the middle of this migration. And it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. Um, in part because it was just so cool to be close to these animals, but also because caribou trails we had been following for, for weeks or even months, um, across mountain ranges and figuring out how to cross rivers and all of these places. So we'd been sort of following caribou and then to actually see them on their own migration was a really, really powerful experience. Oh, I love that. Now, I obviously, I, we, we talked about the beginning of the trip being in Bellingham and you've brought up towards the, towards the end of the trip in, uh, called, uh, Cot- <laughs> I'm going to butcher Cot- this yeah. name. Cot- Cotabue. <laughs> yes, that's the one. But can you just give maybe like a brief overview about about the adventure, the different segments, and 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 how you you broke it up and what you were doing in each sort of segment? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we started, like you said, in Bellingham, and we took rowboats up the inside passage, ending um, at a cabin that we had built previously. Um, kind of the northern end of southeast Alaska. And from there, we left our rowboats and we picked up skis and, and pack rafts. And for anyone who's not familiar with pack rafts are these incredible little inflatable boats that um, weigh only about five to seven pounds. And you can roll them up and put them in your backpack and hike and then transition to boating when you need to. So we hiked or we skied and pack rafted over the mountains into the interior of the Yukon, which is where the headwaters of, of the Yukon River are as some people might be familiar with. And and then from there, we canoed um, to a little community called Dawson City and then uh, hiked and pack rafted from there north and east up to the um, Mackenzie River and then to the Arctic coast and then hiked west along the Arctic coast into the Brooks Range Mountains and then um, traversed those until we reached the No Attack River, which I just mentioned with the caribou. And from there, we canoed again. So it was a number of different modes of transport, and we tried to match those to um, the landscape and what made the most sense, but also keep our logistics as simple as possible. So as you can imagine, shipping rowboats, you know, 
hundreds or thousands of miles to a remote location in the Arctic doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's why we stuck with pack rafts for, for most of the, the section up north. How did you find the transitions? Because, you know, when I do a lot of um, big physical challenges, for example, it's it, it's doing like one thing. So I've, I'm either training for ultra running and I'm going to run for, you know, multiple marathons across multiple days or I'm doing hiking. I'm just doing that one solo activity. But from from here, from what you said, obviously, you, you've, you did a lot of planning, then getting into rowboats, but that was the first time they'd entered the water at Bellingham was the first time that you'd rowed them. And then obviously finishing the rowboats, you were then transitioning into into hiking. So using your legs instead of your arms. Talk us through like how those transitions went and how how challenging it was physically on the body to to do these different physical activities. You know, I, I actually think it it worked really well and maybe give our, gave our bodies a little bit of a break. So we would do one thing, and like you mentioned, the rowboats were using our arms, but that was one of the reasons why we chose rowboats was because it, it's a sliding seat, and so our legs are working the whole time because we did not want to kayak for you know, six weeks or eight weeks and then get out of the kayaks and try to start hiking or skiing. So we tried to think ahead a little bit about how those transitions would work. And I think too, um, psychologically, it was really helpful to have different modes of transport. So we never got a sort of too um, bored or, you know, it, it never became too monotonous to do the same thing day after day. And so the transitions, I think, helped us um, physically to a certain extent on kind of the big scale. We didn't have any injuries on the whole trip, which was pretty incredible. You know, a little bit of chronic overuse here and there, tendonitis, but nothing that stopped us from moving forward. There was also the downside of the transitions, and that was just the very immediate shift from one activity to another. And so things like blisters or um, you know, sore spots or things that, that we had to deal with were a bit of an issue. Transitioning from boating to hiking was a very painful one and our feet turned into mush in just a matter of a couple of days. And so those were the things that I think would set us back. But luckily, they were all sort of manageable problems and we tried to address them as they came up so that we didn't let them turn into really, really big physical problems. But yeah. I mean, as, we, as we've talked, you mentioned, you know, you are you were able to plan a lot of this trip, but there were also certain elements which were unknown. Looking back and reflecting on on the journey, what would you say was was one of the biggest challenges that you had to face and overcome? Yeah, probably the biggest challenge was not the one that was physically hardest. It was the one that was mentally hardest. And that was up in the Mackenzie Delta. So for people who aren't familiar with this region, which I imagine many people aren't, it's um, on the Canadian side of the border up in the Arctic. And it's a river that runs all the way north to the Arctic Ocean. And on paper, it looks like it would be perfect. We were trying to get from um, the Yukon River and some um, the Wind River and other drainages there over to um, the Arctic coast or up to the Arctic coast. And the river flows north. So it seemed like, okay, perfect. Well, you know, we knew there might be some slow water, there might be some bugs, but the the amount of mosquitoes there and the amount of mud and the fact that we were dealing with a, a constant headwind made it just absolutely miserable to the point that we stopped cooking our meals outside. It just wasn't worth trying to um, be in the bugs any longer than we had to. I was, I ended up using, it was totally disgusting, but using my my food dish as a pea dish eventually because it meant I didn't have to go out in the mosquitoes. It, it just consumed every single second of every single day. And that was the first time that either of us really considered quitting. And it, yeah, it just didn't seem worth doing anymore. And we wondered why were we spending our lives having this experience and where were we going and why were we doing this? And I think once um, go down that mental track of, of questioning, you know, why you're taking on this goal, it becomes much, much harder to, to move forward on it. And so that was definitely the, the lowest point of the journey for, for me and I think also for Pat. An incredible, powerful thing to go to as well, actually, being able to ask yourself these questions, you know, why are we doing this again? What are we hoping to achieve? What are we hoping to learn? And being able to to reflect and really think very, very deeply about what you're hoping to gain from this. What stopped you from taking that final decision saying, actually, do you know what? We're done here. I think a combination of things. One is that it was almost logistically impossible <laughs> to get ourselves out of there without calling for some kind of rescue and you know, claiming that you were dying from mosquitoes was a, was probably not going to go too far for most rescues. But yeah, it, it would have required a lot. 
for us to get out of there. And that was the initial um, reason for not quitting. And then the other thing is I've found that so often being in the natural world or taking on physical challenges is just when it seems like it's gone too far and there's no way they can possibly continue. Something happens that changes all of that, whether it's kind of a moment of natural wonder or, you know, a physical um, endorphin rush or, or something that makes it all seem okay. And we certainly had that experience once we left the Mackenzie Delta and made it to the Arctic coast because it was the Arctic of my dreams. And, um, there were, uh, just all kinds of incredible things to see. The bugs were, were much less because of, um, the wind coming off the Arctic ocean. There were birds all over the place. Um, sandhill cranes, these kind of prehistoric, incredible birds parading around all sorts of things that suddenly made it seem like, okay, this is why we've been going through this misery. And it was a similar experience with the caribou after having almost starved and um, been almost eaten by a predatory bear, all these things. And then there's this moment that happens that seems like, okay, this is why, this is why this is, has been going on the way that it has. And so I think, yeah, I try to always keep my mind and going in that direction that it, at some point, this will reveal itself <laughs> as to why the why the suffering or why the difficulties. And it was the case for the Mackenzie Delta as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I'm always fascinated at is, is the relationships, especially when people are out in these, out in nature doing these big physical challenges or journeys. Um, I do a lot of solo adventures and haven't really done anything with sort of an, another person, like, you know, not a husband or a partner. How, how is it when you're out there, um, being with somebody 24 seven in potentially, you know, very stressful situations, like how it, did it, obviously it did strengthen your relationship. Actually, I'm answering the question for you, but you know, t- tell us more, <laughs> tell us more about, about the relationship and, um, you know, how, did it, did it test it? Did it strengthen it? You know, what, what sort of happened? Yeah, I would say both of those things. It certainly tests, you know, your commitment to each other and your commitment to this shared goal, but it, for us, it was absolutely a bonding experience, and much of our time um, being out on adventures in the past had also been the case. But this seemed like such we were both so committed to this this thing that we wanted to do that along the way we felt like partners in every sense of the word. Um, but yeah, absolutely, there are those moments, and it's usually those moments when I feel weakest that I am kind of lashing out at Pat, or you know, vice versa. That it's the people closest to us who bear the brunt of our own insecurities. And that's true out in in the wilderness too. And, and there's also the element of, of risk and how do we manage that? And how do we feel okay about the fact that when we put ourselves into these situations, there's always that chance that something could happen certainly to both of us, but also to one of us. And those are really difficult questions to grapple with. And I think, you know, for this trip, the kind of acute exposure was was somewhat limited, at least compared to other things we've done in the past, like mountaineering or climbing, where it's pretty clear if you screw up, you're not going to make it through that day. And in this case, it was much more of kind of a just long exposure. And it went on enough that we started to kind of accept it as a lifestyle as opposed to just feeling like a, a trip. And so I think that's part of how we reckoned with it. It started to feel ordinary to us in terms of um, dealing with that those sort of daily risks and uncertainties. And um, yeah, but as far as us getting along, I think we really thrive in the outdoors. Um, and there's a huge element of trust that goes into doing a trip. And it's interesting to hear that you tend to do more solo things because that's a whole different um, kind of level of connection to other people or to yourself. And, um, I think there's, you know, some of that in doing with a partner, but then it's, it's a very different context too. And for Pat and I, there's this really deep sense of trust. Like there's no one else I would, you know, follow (laughs) down a river or into the wilds more than I would Pat. And I hope he feels the same way about me that we know each other so well. And we know our, um, kind of capabilities in these wild settings that we were, very much trusting each other and also trusting each other to, to help when things were difficult. So if, you know, if I was having a really off day, I trusted that not only would Pat, you know, work to keep me safe as much as he kept himself safe, but he would also be there for me psychologically. And it's okay to have a day where, you know, things aren't going so well and you're just not there. And so trusting that partner to, to help you through those difficult times, I think is absolutely critical. Mm. 
And this is going to be a really difficult question. I, I'm, I don't know how you're going to answer it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you know, an incredible journey that you've been on. There must have been, you know, incredible moments and experiences. Can you name, you know, just one moment that still sticks with you, still sticks with you now? Just, and I know that's so difficult to try and do, but just that one experience or that one moment that you know made it all worthwhile. Gosh, I mean, I would say that that caribou experience was one of them, but another one that um, was really personal and so important. And I'll just take a quick step back and say that one thing that surprised me a lot about this trip is that although we spent so much time kind of alone, just us or interacting with with critters, uh, bears or caribou or birds and not people, my connections to, to people and my relationships with people were a huge part of the trip, um, both people we met along the way, but also my family and friends who are very physically far away from me that I felt closer to them than, you know, maybe I ever had and maybe ever will. And one of those people who was really uh, important was my dad. And, you know, he, as you mentioned, he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and um, was struggling with that. And we had always had this real, this kind of relationship where, you know, dad and daughter, and if I had anything that I needed fixed or had a problem with, I knew I could always go to my dad. And that had maybe shifted a little bit since he was dealing with his own struggles. But along the, the trip and during the journey, he was right back in that role of like, you've got it, you know, you've got it, kid, you can do this thing. Um, and helping with logistics and helping with anything that needed fixing along the way. And he actually came, um, to Kotzebue where we finished our trip and he was standing uh, on a bridge where we were paddling in and waving at us as we finished our trip. And it was a really powerful moment in so many different ways. And yeah, so I think that was one of them that was so personal to me and, and maybe defines a bit of how being in the wilderness can also um, be about being with people and connecting with um, our relationships. Was it hard uh, finishing the trip and going back to to in quotations normal life? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the short answer yes, it was. Um, you know, I think there's there were these moments that would it would really kind of strike home for us, and you know, after being sleeping and living outside for six months to be inside a building, you know, sleeping inside and just kind of living like you said, normal life you know, hear these things like hear birds passing over or um, notice something out of the corner of your eye and it's a, it's a leaf um, coming, you know, into spring or, or whatever and realizing that we hadn't thought about those things for however long and losing that connection, I think was, it, it felt like grieving kind of. And, you know, like any big transition, you work your way through it, but it was, it was a difficult one for sure. Yeah. You've recently been through another transition, um, a good a good transition. You have become um, a new mom. Um, how are you finding, uh, congratulations, how are you finding ad you. adventures now having a little one and how has that impacted on your on your life? Yeah, so I actually have two little ones oh, now. Two. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's changed everything. And then again, it hasn't. And so We've done a combination of, of venturing out on our own and, and trying to figure out ways to to continue to do some of the adventurous things we love independently. But then we've also tried to incorporate it into our, our family. And um, in fact, next week, we're heading out on a sailboat with our two little boys to Glacier Bay and other places in, in Alaska. So that's been one, you know, one version of it is trying to figure out how do we do things that will work for all of us, but still allow us to get into some of the places we really love. Yeah. What's your advice and tips for, for other women who want to go and challenge themselves, get back to nature, do something truly, truly epic? What would you say? I'd say don't be afraid to dream really big. And you can always rein yourself in later um, and reach out to other people um, for support and advice and uh, logistical uh, tips, all of those things, because I think the reality is that connecting with other people can be a really great way to um, trust that you can do these things. And and I know that there are a lot of people who helped me along the way and have been really inspirational. So yeah, don't be afraid to dream. 
No, I, d- I definitely back that up as well. Like, just dream, dream big. Have these incredible g- dreams. Like, start scaring yourself with your dreams and start thinking, can I do that? Because, yes, you can. And there's, you know, there's so many resources out there and there's so many people willing to help you and support you and to give you advice and information. And, and obviously, you've, you've written an incredible book, you know, The Sun is a Compass. Tell everybody just, I suppose, just a little bit more about the book and where they can get it from. Um, Sure. Yeah, it's uh, available at any major bookseller and hopefully some of the independent bookstores as well. And um, it's a story about the trip, but it's also a story about birds and about my relationship with my husband and my father. And I guess it's I hope it's kind of an inspirational story about being in wilderness and and being able to um, have that experience and share it with others. And I'm going to ask a really, really bad. So if you haven't read this book yet, yeah. you're going to have to read the book. Because I want to know, do you ever find out about why the bird's beak curves? Um, well, we now suspect it's a virus. So this is kind of my, my scientist cap, um, not really in the book itself. But yeah, so we suspect now it's a virus and are still asking lots of questions related to that. So like anything, you know, in science or in nature, you get one answer and it brings up a whole lot more questions. Because yeah, how long were you studying the birds for? Oh gosh, I don't even know if I want to count the years. <laughs> it's been it's been over a decade, and there was a lot of work going on before I even got involved. So it has definitely been one of those scientific mysteries that's been very hard to crack. Yeah, I know. I love it. I, I find it absolutely fascinating stuff. And Caroline, you are also on social media and have your website as well. Where's the best place for people to follow you? Yeah, my website is um, carolinevanhamert dot com, and I'm on Instagram and Facebook as well. Instagram is at Sun Is a Compass. And Facebook is just my name, Caroline Van Hemert. So yeah, I'd love to see you there. Oh, fantastic. So please do go and read Caroline's awesome book, The Sun is a Compass, and go follow along on Instagram. Caroline, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more about this incredible journey that you did. I mean, there's there's so I know there's just so so much more to there's so much more details to go into and it's so difficult when you when you've got sort of only like you know about sort of 50 odd minutes but um definitely recommend people to go and buy the book I mean yeah it's uh how many pages is it uh just about 300 yeah it's 300 pages there's also photos as well so um which is which is super cool um but yeah Caroline thank you so much thank you it's been a pleasure Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Caroline. I really do recommend the book. I've really enjoyed reading it. So there's so much information in there. It's really, really descriptive and it's it's beautifully written, especially going into 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 her life and the challenges and the relationships and nature um so yeah highly recommend it the sun is a compass so please do go check that out just want to give a few shout outs really just to say mass there's so much stuff happening at the moment with women in adventure and also members of the tough girl tribe who've just been smashing on so many levels and um, i had a meet up recently in london and i got to meet some 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 of the my incredible listeners face to face And sometimes I can really forget the power of the podcast and the power of these interviews and sharing these stories and how they can make real impact on different people's lives, especially when you really connect with an episode. And I totally get that you're not going to relate or connect with every single episode. And you may even pick and choose which episodes you you listen to, whether you're into mountaineering or running or climbing. But you can always learn something from from every conversation. There's always something. And um, and it, it's great. I had a message the other day saying, basically, Sarah, um, I was listening to the episode with Di Westaway on a bus and try not to burst into tears. Such an inspiring story, you know, since I'm three years away from turning 50. So I know that these stories really, really do resonate. So Thank you so much for sharing with me. I really do appreciate it. But also, members of the Tough Girl Tribe have been out there absolutely smashing it. One of the things that we do every Sunday, the amazing Alison MacArthur um, shares a post which is all about being supportive, supportive Sunday, where you share the awesome things that you've done this week. And the key thing to remember with this it's not about comparison. It's not about looking at you and comparing yourself with somebody else. It's about you. What have you done? What have you achieved? And why is it important to you? But you know, congratulations to Hannah, who's pedaled 62.5 miles in the wind today. Absolutely amazing. I know Joe um, Joe Bradders, Bradshaw is currently injured. So we've had Joe on the Tough Girl podcast previously. We've had her on two times, actually. 
Joe summited Mount Everest and she's after the seven summits. So I think she's got about two more to go and she's raising funds funds for for place to be. And um, she's working really, really hard on her social media and growing her brand and raising all these funds. So Joe, just keep at it. You will get that. I know you're going to do the seven summits. Massive well done to Rebecca Coles. So Rebecca has started, it's called the Project Alpine Spirit. So they started it this week. Their goal is to become the first all women team to climb the Alpine 4,000 meters peaks. They've done four, they've got 78 to go. And it's quite, um, it's quite interesting project. You can follow them along on Facebook facebook.com forward slash project alpine uh spirit s-p-i-r-i-t so well done rebecca keep after it keep going after that goal massive well done to abby lloyd who did a 10k yesterday she hadn't trained because of a lack of motivation but decided to go along and have fun with it which is the key thing and to be honest i know not everybody is going to feel motivated all the time and it's and it's challenging to stay motivated all the time but sometimes you've almost just got to get into the habits and go through the motions you get up you put your trainers on you put your running gear on you get outside and you go for that run because i promise you you will feel amazing after you've done it. And also the key word that in that sentence, which I want you guys to focus on, is having fun. Exercise and getting outside, it is not a punishment. It is a joy and it is a total, total um, privilege. Catherine Knight has cast off the lines and has set sail on her first voyage from the Clyde to Oban. O-B-A-N, on the beautiful west coast of Scotland. So absolutely fantastic. So we've also spoken with Catherine Knight on the Tough Girl podcast previously about her boat, Narwhal. So do go and check that out. Congratulations to Daphne Mort- Mortiz, M-O-R-I-T-Z, who ran 50 kilometers yesterday. Um, beautiful photo at mile 11. Smiling, happy, I love it. Holly Budge is currently learning to kayak in preparation for her next challenge, which is the coast to coast in February next year. But she has been out on the water. She's been training. So we've also had Holly come on the Tough Girl podcast as well. So Holly Holly came on recently or a couple of weeks ago to talk about her Everest challenge and her two world records that she's achieved. Um, Holly is running an event at the Royal Geographical Society in London. It's on the 6th of June from 6.30 till 10 o'clock. And it's called On the Front Line. Design Thinking Meets Elephant Conservation in Africa. The tickets are between £25 and £75. The speaker, main speaker is Holly Budge, the world record adventurer, conservationist and designer. Holly will be sharing her adventurous tales of fundraising from the summit of Everest to immersing herself with the Black Mambas, an all-female frontline anti-poaching team in South Africa. Holly founded How Many Elephants, a design-led campaign to inspire and educate a global audience about the impact of the elephant ivory trade. To date, she's raised the... To date, she has raised over £300,000 for various charities. To learn more, go and check out Holly's website, hollybudgebudge.com and howmanyelephants.com as well. So that looks like a super amazing event to attend, especially if you're London Brave. Now, I know a couple of the members of Tough Girl Tribe are feeling ill at the moment. So um, I really wish you all the best in getting back a in getting better and recovering. I know it's frustrating when you're ill and you want to be outside, but trust me, you need to focus on your rest and recovery. It is so, so important. Massive congratulations to Lisa McCoy, who completed her through hike of the West Highlands West Highlands Way. And she shared a lot of it on Instagram stories, which was absolutely awesome. So um, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing. You definitely inspired me. The West Highland Way has now gone on my list as well. Damiana, we're in New Zealand. Well done for getting on the back of a horse again I know it's been a number of years since you've done that but I'm so pleased that you have I love the photo that you shared you look super happy and amazing so it's good to face these fears and these little things that you haven't done for a while uh Lee Jenkins, who is currently in Mallorca on a try on a try camp. Enjoy it. You've got the final eight weeks push until your big race in June. Keep working hard keep listening to your body, keep training, keep committed. You're going to be absolutely fantastic. I'm excited to hear all about your triathlon and how you get on. Well done to Leah Atherton, who has just finished running and hiking. I'm I'm going to butcher this. I think you did this on purpose. The, the Rennsteig, R-E-N-N-S-T-E-I-G in Germany, which follows the Trumagen mountain range. Um, absolutely wicked fun running, mostly a mix of fire rows and soft, bouncy pine forest loveliness. Totally recommended for anybody who wanted a hundred mile ish trail that's impossible to get lost on and has decent accommodation along it. So, um, absolutely fantastic. Well done to, to go and do that, that hundred mile trail race. Absolutely awesome. Um, 
And uh, shout out to Donna, who's currently traveling in New Zealand. Enjoy it. Have fun. Make the most of it. It's an incredible country. But yeah, a massive thank you to all members of the Tough Girl tribe, especially everybody who's been buying the Tough Girl buffs, which I sell for £15. And if you're UK, post some packaging is included. If you're further afield, send me a DM anyway, and I can see what I can do with regards to post and packaging. But I love seeing all the photos of everyone wearing their amazing great white and black buffs out on the trails, out cycling, out in the fresh air, and just enjoying life. I really do appreciate your support when you buy the merchandise. To learn more about me and Tough Girl Challenges, please do go check out toughgirlchallenges.com. If you haven't already, like the Facebook part, like the Facebook page, follow along on Instagram so that you can be kept updated on what's going on about new episodes as well. I've mentioned about being a patron and I mention it every single episode. I'd love for you to take action. I'd love for you to, to support me financially. $2 a month really does make a massive difference. If 2,000 of you all subscribed um, at $2 a month, that would be truly life-changing. And what I could do in this space for women would be, um, would be huge. I'm doing my absolute best with with what I have and I am trying my hardest to increase the amount of female role models. It just takes time, it takes consistency, it takes hard work, focus, dedication and I'm giving it my all and I know I'm incredibly privileged to be doing this and thank you all so much for listening. Tell one friend about the Tough Girl Podcast. Have an awesome day. Take care. I'll speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye. <laughs>